Turn with me to uh, Exodus chapter 4. So as you're turning there, as you know, the Denver Nuggets a few weeks ago won their very first NBA championship title. After 47 years, they were victorious. They beat the Miami Heat. Tickets for that final game shot up in price. Uh, the cheapest tickets went for nearly $1,000. And uh, some of the, I think they were called Lexus Access Club seats, went for $50,000. And that kind of reminds me of a story. So a guy won a ticket for the championship game, and when he got to his seat, it's at the very top of uh, the arena there, and it's Ball Arena now, it used to be Pepsi Center, but it's at the very top, and so he could barely see the action on the court, but once the game started, he noticed there's an empty seat down near the, the floor, and so uh, he went down there just hoping uh, that it was a vacant seat, and so he asked the guy sitting next to the vacant seat, is this seat taken? Do you mind if I sit here? And the guy said, no, go ahead, it's actually one of my season seats, uh, but it's available. In fact, my wife and I have had these two seats for over 20 years, and uh, she just passed away. And the guy's like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, um, you sure it's okay if I sit here? And he says, absolutely. I don't want to see this seat go to waste. And then he said, well, can I ask you a question? Why didn't you just bring, you know, a, a friend or a, a relative? I mean, this is the championship game. And he, the guy says, well, I tried, but I couldn't get anybody to come. They were all at her funeral. Well, that didn't it didn't go over well in the first service either so I don't know why I'm a glutton for punishment anyway as we come into chapter 4 of Exodus uh, we are in the middle of an amazing conversation between Moses and the Lord who's speaking from the midst of this burning bush and once again, Moses spent the first 40 years of his life in Egypt. He was the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. But after killing an Egyptian man, he sees fighting a Jewish man. And Pharaoh hears about it. He wants to kill Moses. So Moses flees to Midian. And he would spend the next 40 years in Midian. He'll get married there. He'll have two sons there. But now he's 80 years old and God appears to him when he's on the backside of the mountain, Mount Horeb, and he's got you know his father-in-law's sheep, and then he sees his bush burning. And so as we've seen, the Lord speaks to him, Moses, Moses. And as we saw last week, as we'll see this morning, Moses comes up with one excuse after another as to why he is not the guy God wants to go back to Egypt and set the Israelites free. He's, you know, basically saying, you've got the wrong guy, I'm too old, nobody will listen to me, nobody will believe that you, the Lord, sent me. But the main thing that we see with Moses is that whenever God calls us into ministry, then he will also enable that person to do what he has called them to do. And by the way, if you're saved this morning, if you're born again, God has called you into ministry. Every single one of us as Christians is light and salt. There's no way to get around that. You might not become a pastor or a women's Bible study leader or whatever it might be, but God has a plan for you. So unlike Moses, who keeps beating around the bush, I know, ah, oh, man, just groan after groan. You're not going to even hear what I said last service. That, that was even worse. But anyway, after coming up with one excuse after another, um, the best thing we can do is surrender to the Lord and come to that place of saying, I'm not my own. I was bought with a price, again, the blood of Jesus. So, Lord, what do you want to do in my life and through my life? Or as Isaiah said, Lord, here I am, send me. Use me, Lord, for your plans and purposes. And that should not be a scary thing. After all, Jesus is with us always. The Holy Spirit is in us always. He wants to work in us and through us. He's given us his living word to guide us and strengthen us in our relationship with the Lord. And besides, Jesus has called every Christian to be that light, that salt, 
so the world can taste and see that the Lord is good, that we would reflect His goodness, His grace, His love, His forgiveness. So we don't need to be fearful because Jesus is in us. We don't need to feel weak because the Lord is our strength. We can all come up with one excuse after another, but as we'll see, whatever excuse that we come up with for not letting God use us, it's simply a lame excuse. After all, God knows how weak we are in our own strength. He knows all the fears and all the doubts that we deal with. But as I mentioned last week, we can all relate to Moses. We see that he has five excuses, five reasons as to why God should not use him for this monumental task that God lays out before him. And we see these are five common excuses that we can all come up with. You know, God, this is why I can't go. This is why I can't serve. This is why I shouldn't get involved. This is why I should not step up and be part of the youth group. Now, that's a good reason. You know, fifth and sixth graders, yeah, I'll cut you some slack on them. But be that as it may, as we saw last time, Moses' first excuse was chapter 3, verse 11, where Moses says, Lord, who am I? In other words, Moses is saying, Lord, I had my chance 40 years ago. I messed up. Now I'm too old. You know, I've got a wife and two sons. And, and most of us can relate to that to one degree or another. Lord, who am I? I mean, I've blown it. I'm damaged goods. I'll probably do more harm than good. But God's answer was basically this. I will certainly be with you, Moses. All you need to do is show up, be willing, and I will do the work. After all, it's not really about you, Moses. And, and we can say the same thing. It's not about us. It's all about Jesus. Then we saw Moses' second excuse in verse 13 of chapter 3. After asking the Lord, who am I? He now basically questions the Lord by saying, who are you? you know, have you considered that, Lord? I don't even know how to answer someone if they say, well, who's the Lord? I don't even know what your name is. And so we saw in chapter 3, verse 14, that famous verse where God says, I am who I am. Tell him, I am has sent me to you. In other words, I am the eternal God. I am the omnipotent one. I am the omnipresent one. I am, you know, the omniscient one. I'm all that you will ever need. I am the one true living God, the creator, the sustainer of life. And then goes on to, uh, God goes on to explain to him everything that's going to happen. He says, you're going to go back there, and, and the Israelite leaders are going to you know, listen to you. They're going to believe that I sent you. You're going to stand before Pharaoh. He's going to let you go. In fact, all the Egyptians are going to give you gold and silver and all these beautiful clothes, and God's going to use that in the wilderness to build the tabernacle. And he lays it all out there, and he says, you know, I'm going to bring the people to the promised land, the land I promised, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And not only would all the Jewish people recognize that this is their God doing all these amazing signs and wonders, but even the Egyptians are going to come to realize who the one true God is. And so that's how chapter 3 ended. But now as we come into chapter 4, we see that Moses is still not convinced that he's the one, and he still has three more excuses to go. So look at chapter 4, verse 1. Then Moses answered and said, But suppose... Uh, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. Lord, just suppose they don't believe me. Suppose. In other words, Moses is insinuating here, Lord, you probably didn't think this through. Just suppose this happens. What if I get down to Egypt, Lord, and, and they don't believe me? That's how we would say it today. Usually we don't say suppose. We would say, what if? God, what if I go and then they laugh at me? What if they go, I go and they call me stupid? What if I go and they say, you don't know the Lord? Now again, this is a problem most of us have faced in our lives. What if? And we all fall into this trap of worrying about every possible scenario that could go wrong. We can hinder the work of the Lord that He wants to do in our lives by conjuring up usually all the worst case scenarios we can think of. Lord, what if I get lost in the desert in Egypt? What if a snake bites me, Lord? What if my camel breaks a leg? What if I break a leg, Lord? Have you thought this through? 
But the interesting thing is Moses will get down to Egypt and the Jews will believe him. They are glad he came. They will follow him. And the reality is 99% of the stuff we worry about and fret over never happens anyway. And I've seen this so often throughout the years. And the truth is, even if something bad happens to you, we realize all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. The truth is, even if something bad happens, we soon realize that God is much bigger than any problem that we are facing. And He will allow certain things to come into our lives because He's going to use that to mold us and shape us into the men and women He wants us to be. So He even has a plan to see us through that 1% that might actually take place. So God answers Moses' suppose what if question by saying in verse 2, So the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A rod. So in God's grace, he asked Moses, What's in your hand? And the obvious answer, It's a rod. It's a stick. Now, anytime God asks a question in the Bible, don't think God doesn't know the answer. He obviously knows the answer, but he's always trying to draw the answer out of us. So what's that in your hand, Moses? Well, it's a rod. Literally, it's a shepherd's staff. It would be a, you know, a strong piece of wood, probably six to seven feet high, and it would be used by a shepherd for keeping the sheep in line, but also use it as a weapon if something came after one of the sheep. You know, drive them off. He'd beat them away. Now, this rod would also be a symbol to Moses that he, in his mind, has failed. Because if he would have remained in Egypt and didn't kill the Egyptian guy, he was the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. Many believe he would have become Pharaoh down the line. And so he would have had a staff, a scepter's staff, which is a sign of authority and power. And so having this shepherd's staff... That's really a sign of failure, especially to the Egyptians. You remember the Egyptians despised shepherds. Remember back in chapter 46, I think it was in Genesis, when Joseph, you know, he ends up in Egypt, second in command over all the Egyptian people. And, you know, there's the famine. And, you know, Pharaoh puts Joseph in this place because of the dream and everything. Well, Joseph eventually brings his family down. Jacob and all the boys and all their families come to Egypt. And when they get there, Joseph says, okay, when you talk to Pharaoh, tell him we're all shepherds. And then a couple of verses later it says, for the shepherds are an abomination to the Egyptians. So he wanted them in the land of Goshen, away from the Egyptian people, off on their own. So this is a sign, hey, you have blown it. You are not what you were supposed to be as this mighty you know, Egyptian ruler. But God's going to use him in a powerful way. And so watch what God tells Moses to do with this big stick, this shepherd's staff. Verse 3, and he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. So God would use this simple piece of wood to do miraculous things. But God is obviously the very best at taking very simple things, ordinary things, and do something extraordinary. Think of the two simple pieces of wood that became the cross upon which Jesus would die. And he would pay for the sins of the world, shedding his blood upon that cross, those two uh, wood beams. Very simple pieces of wood. Thousands of people were crucified on crosses, but that one particular cross is where Jesus paid the price in full for all of our sins. But as you think about it, God often uses the simple things we have in our hands to accomplish his plans and his purposes for our lives. In other words, he doesn't give Moses some, you know, sword that's forged in the fires of Mordor. You know, he doesn't give Moses these supernatural, you know, Marvel cartoon character superpowers. Oh, now he's invisible. Oh, now he can, you know, throw light. No, he, he was just an ordinary person. So God basically says, what's in your hand? He says, oh, Rod. God's like, okay, let's use that. And that common shepherd's staff will become a tool that God uses to do tremendous things 
It's going to humble Pharaoh. It's going to break the Egyptians. It's going to do miracles, so to speak, out in the wilderness in front of the Jews. People often ask the question, what is God's will for my life? The answer may be as simple as what's in your hand. What has God blessed you with? Where has he placed you in life? Maybe it's a hammer or a wrench in your hand. How might you use that for the kingdom of God? Maybe it's a laptop computer. Maybe it's your home. Maybe it's a skill you developed in whatever work you've been doing. How can you use that for the kingdom of God? I'm always reminded of the time when Jesus was ministering to the multitudes. They're up around the Sea of Galilee. And, you know, it's getting late in the day. And Jesus tells the disciples, you know, the people are getting hungry. We don't want to send them away. You give them something to eat. And so this is what we read. Andrew, one of the disciples, says this to Jesus in John chapter 6, verse 9. There's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? And they even said... 200 denarii, or 200 days' wages, is enough to feed multitude. 5,000 men, plus their wives and kids, they guesstimate about 20,000 people out there. We don't have enough money to give them even a tiny bit. Well, here's this little boy, willingly surrenders his little Lunchable. You know, five barley loaves, two small fish, and in the hands of Jesus, he multiplied that, he fed, and literally means they were stuffed after eating all that fish, all that bread. And then the disciples gathered up 12 baskets full of the, the leftover bread. So the point is God can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we might ask or think. Just give him what you have. What's in your hand? I don't know. What do I got? What, what are you willing to say? Here, Lord, take this, use it. I mean, I can picture Jesus saying to Peter, Hey, Peter, what's that in your hand? Well, it's a fishing net. Perfect. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Paul, what's that in your hand? It looks like you like to write. Yeah, I got a pen here. Well, good. I'm going to use you to write half the New Testament. You know, we, we see this in the Old Testament as well. In, in the book of Judges, we read of Shamgar. He had a pointy stick. And with that pointy stick, he killed 600 of the enemy, Philistines. Same thing with Samson. Samson had a jawbone of a donkey. And with that... He killed 1,000 Philistines. I mean, you look at uh, David with his little slingshot coming against the mighty Goliath. I mean, you don't need all this super knowledge and wisdom and all these things. You just need to be saying, here, Lord, here I am. And whatever you got, God will use it. He'll do abund abundantly above all that we ask or think. So when Moses throws down his staff, it becomes a, well, six or seven foot snake. And it says he runs away, probably because he didn't have any sandals on. God said, take your sandals off your feet. So he runs away. Well, verse 4, then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. And so this will be the first of three miracles God's going to do uh, to, with Moses here to say, this is how you're going to prove to the Israelite leaders that you have been sent by me. Now, on a side note here, God tells Moses, grab this large snake by the tail. Typically, you don't pick up a, take, a snake by its tail because they can just whip around and strike you. So as soon as he touches the tail, boom, it turns back into a stick. So often in the Bible, Satan is depicted as a snake, as the serpent. And so at this time in, Israel, uh, in Egypt's history, the serpent was one of the main gods that the Egyptians worshipped. So God is showing Moses that he will be victorious over the Egyptians. At the same time, the Jews will see this as God's power, his authority over the original serpent, Satan. In fact, Satan is the one who is behind all the idolatry that was in Egypt I mean, they worship hundreds of different gods, and we'll see with the ten plagues, God's going to come against those Egyptian gods. But Satan is the one who's behind all the killing of the baby boys. Remember all the Jewish baby boys? Pharaoh said, as soon as they're born, throw them in the Nile River. Sad. Satan is the one who, who's behind all the slavery and bondage of the Jews in Egypt. 
He's still behind all that nasty stuff today. Who's behind abortion? Satan. You know, who's behind human trafficking? It's Satan. You know, Jesus makes it very clear in John 10, verse 10, the thief, Satan, does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And so here God is showing Moses God's authority over Satan. You and I, we have authority over the enemy. We don't have to walk around defeated. He can spew his lies. He can try to intimidate you, but he has no authority over us. A great verse is 1 John 4, verse 4, where John says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you, that's Jesus, is greater than he who is in the world. Now look at the second sign God gives Moses here in verse 6. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, Now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. And he said, Put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in his bosom again and drew it out of his bosom. And behold, it was restored like his other flesh. Then it will be, if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. Leprosy is one of those dreaded diseases. It's been around for thousands of years, uh, especially in biblical times. I mean, it was a brutal, horrible disease. It starts off as just a little you know, spot on the, your skin, but... It'll slowly but surely spread throughout your body. Um, if you've seen pictures of those who've had leprosy, and it was now they can treat it, but back then you couldn't. I mean, you'd lose literally. Your fingers would fall off. Your toes would fall off. It would keep going on your whole body. Your ears, your nose would fall off, and eventually it would kill you. And the Bible depicts leprosy as a type of, you know, it's an example of sin. Because sin starts off a little bit, you know, small, and if it goes untreated, that little sin will continually spread throughout your life, and it'll cause so much damage. Eventually, it'll kill you. This is why the Bible calls on all people to repent. Turn away from that sin, turn to Jesus, and He will stop the spread of sin in your life. In fact, Jesus will wash away all of your sins. He has the only cure for sin, and that's His perfect spotless blood. And so for the Egyptians and the Jews, seeing this sign, you know, his hand is eaten away, pulls it out, it's like, ah, put it back in, now it's fre fresh again. That would be a tremendous, powerful testimony of God's strength, God's authority. And again, all the miracles God will do in Egypt will reveal to all the people that there is only one true living God, Yahweh, Jehovah. And for you and me as followers of Jesus today, we have a tremendous testimony of God's power to save us from all of our sins, to heal us of the damage that our sins brought into our lives. And Jesus has restored us. He has delivered us. He's brought us into the kingdom of God and the fruitful, abundant life of walking in the power of the Spirit where the fruit of the Spirit is produced, hopefully abundantly, love, joy, peace, patience, and so forth. Well, look at verse 9. It says, And it shall be, if they do not believe the, even these two signs, or listen to your voice, that you shall take water from the river and pour it on the dry land. The water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. So again, the third sign, take water out of the Nile River, pour it on the land, and it will turn to blood. In fact, this will be the very first of the ten plagues when uh, the water of the Nile River turns into blood. Now, why is this important? Because the Nile River has always been the lifeblood of the nation of Egypt. Uh, it was very, very important. In fact, they worshipped the Nile River as one of their main gods. So don't think that worship of Mother Earth and worship of all creation is a new thing. It's been going on since shortly after the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. In other words, we were created to worship. But once a person turns their back on God 
and they lose that consciousness of who God is in their hearts and in their minds, and they'll quickly start to worship anything and everything under the sun, including the sun, which the Egyptians did. Ra, the sun god. And when we get, you look at Romans chapter 1, you see the devolution of man. They turn away from the one true God, and they begin to worship humans, four-footed animals, little creepy crawlies. They'll worship anything and everything. But when we get to the judgments of God against Egypt, we'll see that God is directing each judgment against a specific deity that the, the Egyptians worshipped. So God will easily prove to both the, you know, the Egyptians and the Jews that He is the one true God. He alone is worthy to be worshipped. Now, don't forget, the Egyptians also had blood on their hands. Uh, they've been throwing baby boys, the Jews, into the Nile River to kill them. And so now they, they love blood so much, God's going to say, okay, I'm going to make you drink it. This is simply known as the justice of God, people getting what they deserve. I highly encourage you, do not pray for yourself. God, give me your justice. You don't want God's justice. You want his grace. You want his mercy. If I got what I deserved, I'd be toast. And, and so would most of you in here. You know, we pray for his mercy and his grace. So God gives Moses these three signs to prove to the people that the Lord has sent Moses to them. And at the same time, God is basically telling Moses, stop with all the what ifs. You know, if you step out in faith, if you trust me, I will be there with you. And that's all Moses really needed to know. And really, that's all we need to know. Suit up, and God will show up. Put on the armor of God, and he will be with you every step of the way, whatever battles you face. If we have the attitude of Isaiah, here I am, Lord, send me, then God will. Then God will open up doors that no one can shut. He'll shut doors that no one can open. And then we can go forward in the strength of the Lord instead of in the weakness of our flesh. So now that Moses has these three powerful signs, God's answered his first three questions, you would think, okay, now he's ready to submit and say, okay, Lord, let's go for it. But he's not done yet. He still has more excuses. Why? You've got the wrong guy. Look at verse 10. Then Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant. But I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. That's his fourth excuse. I don't talk too good. That's what he's coming up with. I, I don't talk very well. And I, I can certainly identify with this. Um, we don't have any evidence, though, with Moses that he had any kind of speech impediment. He didn't, probably didn't have a lisp. He probably didn't even stutter. You know, we read about him talking a lot in four of the five books that he wrote, you know, other than Genesis and Exodus, he talks a lot. Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, he's speaking all the time, and it always sounds great to me. You know, whatever excuse he had with his speech, I think it was all conjured up in his mind. But this is another excuse he comes up with to try to get, you know, out of God's plan for his life. We even read in Acts 7, Verse 22, uh, this is Stephen giving you know, his defense before the Jewish people before he stoned to death. And he says of Moses, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now, I don't see any stuttering with Moses, but again, we can be so much like him. The problem is almost always the same. We look at our own inadequacies instead of looking at the Lord who is perfect in every way. How often we forget that God, with God, all things are possible. With me, not so much, but with God, all things are possible. And it's sad that we focus on our limitations instead of focusing on the Lord and His unlimited resources. The Lord showed me many years ago um, there's basically two sides to the pride coin, you might say. We usually think of someone with puffed up with pride as the one who has that boastful, arrogant attitude. Look at me, I'm so great, I'm so awesome, but they're just a know-it-all. And usually we think, wow, this guy thinks very highly of himself, more highly than he should. 
that person is just yuck. The other side of the coin, though, is when we think so lowly of ourselves and we're so worried and concerned about how other people look at us, how they view us, that we can no longer do what God has called us to do. So often we let fear, um, we let people intimidate us, you know, fear of people, fear of not being eloquent, and we shrink back from what God has called us to do. Um, I've used this example many times with my own life. Many of you have heard my testimony. And like when I was in grade school, I kind of had my own little language. You know, elephant was dopident. People would say, it's elephant, dopident. No, Jeff, elephant, dopident. <laughs> and so for six, first six years that I was in school, they had me in speech therapy. And after the six years, they went to my parents and said, that's basically as good as it's going to get, you know? And they were like, eh, okay, whatever. And so, you know, I always grew up thinking, oh, man, whatever I say, people are going to be like, oh, laughing and pointing fingers. And in high school, I was great at English. I could write papers. I even had some papers. I found out a few years later, the teacher, I can't remember her name, but she was laminating some of my papers and passing them out. This is how you're to do this assignment. But then in that same class, I'd have to get up and give a speech. Man, I'd start sweating. I'd start shaking. I'd just be, you know, and I'd just run in fear, basically. And then even in college, before I got saved, I'm in college. And I was at San Diego State. I had to take a speech class. Oh, I dreaded it. I didn't want to be there. And my best friend, Rob, he's, we were on the baseball team together at San Diego State, and he's sitting in the front row just laughing his head off. You know, because we had this assignment. We had like, I don't know, it was like 10 minutes. You have to get up there and give an oral presentation on some example. You had to use like an illustration. And so I, I couldn't think of anything. And so I finally had this, it was a pitching tool. I was a pitcher. So you'd have this baseball on this little stick. And you'd spin it. Here's a fastball. Here's a curveball. Here's the slider. And, you know, so I'm up there for about a minute I'm like, uh, this is a baseball on a stick. And I mean, I'm sweating, I'm shaking, Rob's laughing his head off at me. And I'm like, uh, after a minute, I'm done, man. And I, I ran out, I literally ran out. And, and the teacher at the end, you know, when she's giving out the grades, it was a credit, no credit class. And she goes, I can't put you through this again, Jeff. I'll give you credit for it. You know, you tried. And so it was like, oh, thank you. I could not do it again. And then I get saved just shortly after that. It was my junior year. I get saved. And, and then I didn't go to my senior year. I ended up going to Bible school. And uh, at the end of the school, uh, we went on, there was 20, 54 in our class. So 18 went to London. 18 went to Mexico City. 18 of us went to Kauai. Got to suffer for the Lord somewhere. And so we backpacked around the whole island of Kauai, and we helped plant Calvary Chapel, Kauai. It was really an awesome experience. And then when we get back, the, you know, Pastor Mike McIntosh is like, okay, pick one person out of each of those three areas, and we want them to speak and tell everybody how it went at the, you know, your, uh, you know, your trip and so forth. And, and so for whatever reason, they picked me. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. And they're like, no. So anyway, you, you've got it was like 10 or 12 minutes. And I wrote everything out I'm going to say. And I probably read over it 100 times, had it down. OK, 12 minutes. I got it. I get up there, and I just poof, froze, sort of sweating and shaking. And I was done in five minutes. I don't even know what I said. And Mike comes out and says, OK, Jeff, you got another seven minutes to go. What else are you going to share? Can't do it. I mean, I just froze up. It was brutal. So I ran off. And the Lord used that, and he showed me. You are so full of yourself, Jeff. You have pride. You are so concerned about how other people are viewing you and how they hear you. Your eyes are on yourself. Get your eyes off yourself. Get your eyes on me. If he can speak through a donkey, he can speak through me. You know, he can speak through you. And so we have no excuses. And so God had to break me of that. I mean, he's got a sense of humor putting me in ministry I mean, I always felt called to ministry, but never to be a pastor. I always wanted to be behind the scenes, but God had other plans. So don't let fear of man intimidate you. Just do what God's called you to do, and he will equip you. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, this is where Paul says, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ." 
So whatever Moses lacked in eloquence, you know, whether it was in his own mind or if it was real or not or just imagined, he was trying to use it as an excuse. God, you can't use me. I'm this way. I'm that way. I'm slow of speech. And God's got other plans for him, obviously. Verse 11. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? This is a verse you never hear read in a word of faith church, by the way. Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. In other words, God is saying, Moses, I am sovereign. I created you. I did not make a mistake. And, and you know, it's really sad when we look at people and we size them up and, and we see them if they have a physical disability, maybe a mental disability, and we think, well, God must have made a mistake there or God must be punishing them or their parents for some sin they're probably involved with. That's wrong. God has a plan and purpose in everything. Here's a great example in John chapter 9, Verses 1 through 3, Jesus is walking with his disciples, and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? So to them, it was like black and white. Who sinned, this guy or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. I mean, we're all sinners, but he's saying it's not some specific sin they committed, and that's why this guy was born blind. Obviously, he was born blind. He hadn't even sinned yet. But Jesus says that the works of God should be revealed in him. And Jesus spit on the ground and stuck the mud in his eyes. I love that. <laughs> And he sticks the mud in his eyes, and he tells him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And those of you that have been with us in Jerusalem, you know where the pool of Siloam is and where this miracle is. He's like stumbling, trying to find out, where's the pool of Siloam? And so people are probably guiding him there. I got spit and mud in my eyes. And, and then he washes, and he can see, though. The Lord heals him. Again, we've all been born with a sin nature. We live in a fallen world. Don't blame God. He doesn't make mistakes, but he'll use whatever our physical limities, limitations are, our uh, physical infirmities, whatever it might be, God can still use us. Whether you were born with something or you had an accident or an illness, God can still use you. You are a vessel of honor for his glory if you will allow him to work in you and through you. And I always love the examples of people like Johnny Erickson Tata. You know, she was a healthy young gal. She was like 17. She dives into a pool, snaps her neck, becomes a quadriplegic. And she was suicidal. You read her autobiography. I mean, she was so down, so discouraged, thought her life was over. But God got her through it. God has used her. I mean, she spoke at Billy Graham Crusade. She's been all over the radio, TV, written dozens of books. She's an amazing artist. She paints with her mouth. I mean, she says, now, I wouldn't trade my life for anything. I wouldn't go back, I mean, because God did such an amazing thing through her. And then you look at, oh, I always forget his last name, Nick. <laughs> what? Wojciech, that guy. Yeah, what an amazing guy. He spoke down at Night Vision a few years ago, and, you know, he has no arms, born that way, no arms, no legs. You know, he's, they kind of prop him up on a stool. And that guy's got such an amazing testimony. He is, he's just been used by God in so many ways. And he even talks about it, too, where he was so down, so discouraged, so depressed, but God gets him through it, and then he's a vessel in God's hands. Uh, a guy that Elizabeth and I have watched quite a bit of lately, his name is Justin Peters. I encourage you to look at some of his videos. Justin Peters has congenital uh, cerebral palsy. He's, you know, in a wheelchair. He really speaks out against the Word of Faith movement. I mean, he, he was going to some of these places, laying hands on him. Oh, you're not being healed. It's your lack of faith and all the other nonsense, they would say. And God is using him to expose so many of these false teachings. The point is, God blesses them and he will bless anybody in amazing ways in spite of our limitations or sometimes because of our limitations. God is telling Moses, even if you were born blind, even if you were born deaf, I can still use you for my glory. 
You know, it's not because of who you are, Moses. It's because of who I am. And don't ever forget that. The, the key to all this is what God says here in verse 12. I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. And again, that's true for me. That's true for you. Whatever God calls you to do, he will also enable you to do it. He never says, go do this, and then he leaves you on your own. Never. He will always equip us with whatever he calls us to do. We have great examples. Um, Mark chapter 13, look at this verse. Verse 11, Jesus tells his disciples and to us, But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And so when you find yourself in a situation where you don't know what to say, you don't know what to do, trust God because in that moment he'll give you the right words. I mean, he's done that with me plenty of times. But one of the keys is spend time in the word. Let the word of God get into your heart and mind, into your life, because the word of God in a lot of ways is like ammunition. And so the Holy Spirit, when he wants to drive the enemy off, he wants that ammunition it's like Jesus being tempted. How did Jesus respond to Satan? Three times. It is written. It is written. It is written. And, and so the Lord wants us to be in the Word, get the Word in us, and the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance all that He has done, all that He says for us, and we don't have to give in, cave in to the lies of the enemy. I know you've experienced that. I've experienced that when the Holy Spirit brings to remembrance the right Scripture for the right situation. Another example is in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John get arrested, and you know they're arrested for preaching the gospel, and they stand before the religious leaders, and then it says, I think it's in Acts 4, maybe it's verse 1, where it says, Peter, no, not the yet. <laughs> Peter says, or it says of Peter, he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and so he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he gives this tremendous testimony to the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin. And he says, you guys had Jesus crucified because they're the ones cheering everybody on. Crucify him, crucify him. And it was the same guys. It's only like a couple months after Jesus was crucified, rose from the dead. And now Peter and John are arrested. They're standing before them. And he goes into the fact that you guys did this to him. He was buried, but he rose again the third day. And there's salvation, no other name above, you know, given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus, and then chapter 4, verse 13 the Sanhedrin kind of gathered together and it says, When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And here's the key. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. That's the key for all of us. Hang out with Jesus. Spend time being in the word with the Lord, letting the Spirit speak to your heart, strengthening you. You might think, well, I'm uneducated in the scriptures. I'm untrained. Well, these guys were just hicks from the Sea of Galilee. You know, even the girl says, your speech betrays you, Peter, because they had that southern drawl up there in the Sea of Galilee. And, you know, we hear somebody from the deep south, and we're thinking, they must be kind of dumb the way they talk, y'all. And then I realized, the Lord showed me a long time ago. So the guy that ordained me, Justin Alfred, he's from Mississippi. He played football at university, I think in Mississippi State. And big, strong guy. And he sounded like, you know, Elvis Presley. How y'all doing? And that guy's brilliant. I mean, he's Greek scholar. He's an Aramaic scholar. What do you need that for? He's a Hebrew scholar. And you'd think this guy is... Just fell off the turnip truck? No way. God can use anybody if you surrender your life to Him. All the glory goes to God because He didn't choose you. He didn't choose me because we're these awesome, amazing people, but He chose us so that He could do awesome and amazing things in us and through us for His glory. Look at these verses. Some of my life verses, <laughs> maybe some of yours as well. 1 Corinthians 1 starting in verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Now, he didn't say not any. 
Because you guys got guys like Jason Lyle, astrophysicist that was here last summer. Yeah, that guy's brilliant. So he didn't, didn't say he didn't choose any, but he didn't choose many that are like that. For you see your calling. But verse 27, God cho has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the mighty, or the things that, which are mighty. Verse 28, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. And here's one of the reasons why, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Oh, God, you picked me. You got the right guy. No, no flesh can glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So real quickly, look at verse 13. The final excuse that he comes up with, but he, even after God said all this, I created you, Moses, I'll speak to you, I'll speak through you, but he said, oh, my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else you may send. There's got to be somebody else you can use, God, not me. And so now the Lord is angry. Verse 14, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God." And you shall take this rod in your hand with which you shall do the signs. So even though God is angry at this point with Moses because of his fear, his doubts, his not really trusting the Lord, God doesn't give up on him. Yes, God will allow Aaron to be his helper. But as we'll see, Aaron was actually you know, a major hindrance in the ministry, you might say. Aaron would bring a snare to the people of Israel. When Moses is on Mount Sinai, he comes down, he's got the two, you know, tablets, and what does he hear? Joshua says, sounds like there, there's victory, a war. And he goes, no, it sounds like a party going on. And they're worshiping this golden calf. Aaron, what did you do? I didn't do nothing. I just asked for everybody to give me the gold. I put it in the fire, and poof, out came this golden calf. Later on, we read, no, Aaron fashioned the golden calf for them to worship. Not a good thing. But God is determined to use Moses, and God will even, you know, bring Moses tremendous victories. And, and Moses ends up being the main spokesman. Aaron will help him out initially, but I think as Moses finally understands, no, God is the one that's going to use me He'll give me the words. I just need to be faithful. God will raise up Moses to be really the, one of the greatest figures in biblical history. One of the greatest figures you read about. I mean, he would just be a man of faith, and Aaron would die off eventually, and God is going to continue to use Moses. It wasn't about Moses' faithfulness, but it was all because of God and his faithfulness to fulfill his word and his promises to the Jewish people. So don't think, oh, I got to work my way up. I got to, you know, work up all this courage or whatever it might be. No, you just need to say, Lord, I'm nothing, but your word is all I need. And God, you're everything to me. And I just surrender to you. And God will do tremendous things in your life and through your life. And you might be 80 years old like Moses. And finally, the light bulb comes on. Or I don't think we got 40 years to hang out and wait like Moses did. So now, no matter how young you are or old you are, just say, here I am, Lord, use me, and God will.